sex toys, oral sex, vibrators, things like that. They say, is it okay to use those kind of things? Let's just say it's not clearly forbidden in the Bible. We both agree on it. It's not physically unsafe and it doesn't harm our relationship. I would do it if I were you. I'd do it four or five times just to make sure you like it. What I'm basically saying is get your Batman suit out and have a big time. We share ownership of each other's body. Another way to say it is this, is this is your body. It's here for your pleasure. And I want to serve you. The, the secret of sexual fulfillment is a servant spirit. When two servants get into bed to have sex, they come out happy. Because they serve each other. But if you're selfish, you're not going to be sexually fulfilled. And so it's a servant spirit. It's real quiet in here right now. That's okay. That's all right. I'm, I'm okay. So let me talk about the parameters that God has put on sex. Uh, the parameters that, now, so the devil wants you to believe that God is a big fuddy-duddy and he doesn't want you to have fun. But the parameters that God has put on sex is to protect us and keep us from harming ourselves. Now the instruction manual in your glove box of your car, I don't think you've ever taken the instruction manual out and flipped through it and said, well, they'll tell me to change the oil and they tell me to do this. They tell me, I don't believe that. You throw it out the window. They just don't want me to have any fun in this car. No, no, they, they built the car. You know, they, they know how that car is supposed to run. And if you'll do what the, the, the owner's manual says, you'll have, a, you'll have a lot better experience. The Bible is the owner's manual for humans. And our creator is trying to tell us through his word what's going to bless us and what's going to hurt us. So here's what God says. No adultery, fornication, which means sex outside of marriage. Incest, homosexuality, bestiality, rape, pornography, or fantasy lust. That's, that's what it says. Okay. So when it says that, it's, it's just putting a fence on the yard. It's a big yard. There are many different ways that we can have sex, but there's a fence. Why, why is there a fence around the yard? Because there are monsters. Look at our society right now. If you take the fence down, they're monsters. They're going to eat you. They're gonna, look, look at what's happening in people's lives today. So we put a fence around the yard, but we say, well, how big is the yard? Well, so as a you know, counselor for many years and as a pastor, people ask questions about different things. Um, sex toys, oral sex, vibrators, things like that. They say, is it okay to use those kind of things? Well, rather than just directly answering those questions, here are the questions that you need to ask. First of all, if something is forbidden in the Bible, don't do it. And if you do it, you know, repent and God will forgive you. Uh, is it clearly forbidden in the Bible? That's the first question. If it is, don't do it. Uh, do we both agree on it? Is, this, is, is it mutually agreed upon? And one person may like it better than the other, but do you agree on it? You shouldn't force something on your spouse, especially sin. Is it physically unsafe or harmful? Obviously, you wouldn't want to do something that is physically unsafe. Does it harm our relationship? That's another question. What, what's going to happen to our relationship as a result of this. Okay, so let's just say it's not clearly forbidden in the Bible. Uh, we both agree on it. It's not physically unsafe and it doesn't harm our relationship. I would do it if I were you. <laughs> I'd do it four or five times just to make sure you like it. <laughs> what I'm basically saying is get your Batman suit out and have a big time. <laughs> See, again... The, the, concept, the concept that God is grossed out by sex or that somehow you, you, know, you can't have fun. God, God made our bodies where we don't have to have intercourse to have fun having sex. There are many ways that you can pleasure each other in marriage and you do need to be, there needs to be some creativity there. So it's not just missionary sex intercourse that God designed. He designed our bodies to where you know, we, can have, we can have all kinds of fun without having intercourse or having intercourse or whatever. So it's, it's, a big, it's a big yard is what I'm trying to say. It's a big yard. I had a couple that came in to see me one day for counseling. It was the saddest thing in the world. And I'd known them for a long time. I'd pastored them for a long time. Sweet couple. And they came in to see me and they wouldn't look at me. And they both sat down, you know, in my office. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't make eye contact. They went like this. Well, Pastor Jimmy, there's something we need to talk to you about. And I said, well, what's, what's going on? So they, they stammered around forever. Oh, yeah. well, here's the bottom line of what it took uh, forever for them to say. She couldn't have intercourse. She had a physical problem. She couldn't have intercourse. But they were having all kinds of fun sex. Just having fun sex. And doing stuff like I just talked about there. 
And, uh, and they wouldn't look at me. They looked down like this. And, you know, and basically, they were just having a great time. They just felt really guilty about it. And so they finally agreed to come in and talk to me and kind of let me mediate it once and for all. And so they got finished talking. They, they weren't doing anything against the Bible. Nothing against the Bible. They were just having fun. And I said, look, y'all look at me. They wouldn't look at me. I said, look at me. Look, look at me. And, they, and I looked at him. I said, you know how proud I am of you? He went, what? I said, you are being such a wonderful, wonderful husband to your wife. She can't have intercourse and you're, you're not shaming her or judging her or going somewhere else. You're, you're loving your wife in spite of it. And I looked at her and I said, do you know how proud I am of you? And she said, what? And I said, you are being such a champ with your husband. that You've got a physical problem, but you're taking care of your husband. And they left my office with their shoulders back. <laughs> I'm sure they went home and had sex. They probably did several things they've been thinking about but didn't want to do yet, you know. <laughs> so, you know, the Bible's a really thick book. You know why the Bible's a thick book? Because when God has to say something, something to say, he says it. And when the Bible doesn't say something, it's saying something. So don't let the devil put shame on you. Don't let him lead you to believe that there's something wrong with sex. It is a beautiful, wonderful gift that God gave us. And God loves to see his children enjoying his creation and sex is his creation. Let me talk about temptations for just a minute uh, that are very real in our society today. The devil is very real and there's temptations out there. And let me talk for just a minute about pornography, both for men and women, because we both, men and women both have their, their forms of temptation. Pornography is very uh, you know, prevalent today in our society, there, it just is. Here's the problem with pornography is that it's not entertainment, it's sex education. And what pornography does that is so dangerous for a man is it de-emotionalizes and hypersexualizes women. And it tries to get you to believe that that's normal. It's, it's normal for a woman just to have animal type of sex, void of her emotions, and just to have all the sex all the time. And that's just not true. A normal woman, if you married a normal woman, there's a, there was a book one time called Sex Begins at the Breakfast Table. If you married a normal woman, uh, when you wake up in the morning, if she's going to have sex later in the day, you have to pastor her all day long. You, you have to care about the washer being broken. You have to care about Johnny's grades. You have to care about her mother's broken finger. In fact, you'll probably need to call her mother and pray for her. <laughs> or you'll pay for it later. See, a normal, a normal woman, her sexuality is just completely connected to her emotions. And it's just not real. Pornography is just not real. It's a lie. And I know many men who have divorced their wives or put all kinds of pressure on their wives trying to get them to do things they saw in pornography when they're married to a wonderful, precious woman who's just normal. Let me, let me say another thing, too, if the guys you want to think it through. Do you really want a woman like the women in pornography that you really could never leave the house and believe that she was going to be faithful by the time you got home? You, you really want to be married to somebody like that? No, you want a, you want a, a pure woman. And if you married a, a normal woman, they're very, they're emotional. They are sexual, but they're put in touch with sex through their emotions. And a loving man who makes them feel secure and pastors them will get the reward of good sex. Okay. Let me talk about female sex for just a minute, because, or female pornography for just a minute. Because women, you know, women do watch pornography some. Uh, but, you know, romance novels uh, and soap operas. And some movies that are on, uh, they have the same effect as male pornography. And let me, let me explain this to you. They hyper-emotionalize and desexualize men. So women's form of pornography is less sexual. It's more, it's more emotional. So you have these soap operas where you have these abnormal men who like to stay inside with women all day and talk. <laughs> and they always smell good. You know, that's not normal. Harvey comes in at night, he smells, he's tired. You know? He's a normal man. And you're just saying, well, he doesn't look like Lance. <laughs> See, the worst thing on earth is comparison. 
when you begin to compare your spouse with anyone else, it's just not right. And so, you know, 300 years ago, you were out in a pasture somewhere, lived on a farm. You didn't have the ability constantly, all day long, to be barraged with images of somebody else. You couldn't go on the internet and just pick out the person you like best and compare your spouse to them. And that was a blessing. That was better. Today, we have to, we have to be careful of what we allow into our minds and into our hearts. Listen. You take the person that God gave you and you be thankful for that person. You steward that person before God. But don't compare them to anybody else. Let me say just another couple of things and we're going to do our vow renewal. So, so let me talk about expectations of what's normal. First of all, every couple has their own unique style of sex. And if you're happy, that's great. It, it doesn't matter how much you're having sex. If you're happy with what you're doing... Just don't, don't compare yourself to anybody else. Research, the Journal of the American Medical Association, found that most couples who think they're sexually dysfunctional are not. They're just comparing themselves to somebody else. They're not actually dysfunctional. And by the way, the average couple has sex uh, 1.5, two times a week. You say, what does that 0.5 look like? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I need to call that couple that I counseled. <laughs> They probably know. A couple of times a week. You know, one or two times a week. But you may have sex more than that. You know, that's great. Good for you. Uh, so let, let me say just a minute. So let's say that one of you, because some women are more sexual than their husbands now. So let's just say one of you wants sex ten times a month. Okay? Great. And let's say that you're married to someone who wants sex two times a month. So how much do you have sex? Well, I'm about to give you the answer here. Okay. Uh, not two. Because if you only have sex two times a month, it means the person who wants less sex is controlling the relationship. Maybe not ten. Now, if you did have sex ten times a month, you only want it two times a month, you're, you're a great servant. You really are. Good for you. You need to get a medal or something. <laughs> but if one person wants sex ten times and the other person wants it two times, ah, four, five, six times. That means there's compromise on both sides. That means there's goodwill on both sides. Sex is a precious gift that God gave us to bond our relationship. And it is the covenant seal and sign of marriage. It is sacred. It is sacred. And when I read you the powerful things that happen when you're having sex, that's exactly why Satan wants to come between you. So that he can take something very, very precious away from you. And you may have had previous abuse. I heard one time someone say that 40, 40 to 50 percent of women... Uh, had been previously abused. I think that's accurate and in some way. And it might have scarred you. It might have done something to you. My encouragement to you, if you're dealing with physical problems, erectile dysfunction, vaginal dryness, previous abuse, guilt from an abortion, guilt from you know an affair or something, go get help. It's not just affecting you. It's affecting your spouse. Go get help. Go get help. And you can get help. Go, go to a doctor if you need to go to a doctor. But just say to your spouse, I'm not going to sexually strand you because I'm having a problem. You're important enough to me that I'm going to go get the help that I need so that we can have everything that we need to have in our marriage.